And uh, got it. Well, uh, my name is Elizabeth, and it's wonderful to be with you all this morning. I'm coming to you from Austin, Texas. I see Mr. Cunningham there is at the Capitol representing. So uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about my organization, which is EcoRise. Uh, be happy to share my screen if that'd be all right. Oh, I don't have that option just yet. All right, thank you. Uh, so this is our um, homepage. You're welcome to visit it. I'll drop the link in the chat. But uh, EcoRise is a nonprofit, so a 501c3 here in the United States, meaning that our goal is truly to uh, work ourselves out of a job. So if we are successful and all students are empowered to have access to environmental education, and to be the sustainability leaders of the future, then there wouldn't be a need uh, for EcoRise anymore. But as we know right now, a lot of students don't get access to this information in K-12 public schools, at least here in the United States. Uh, and we have a focus on making sure that students are able to impact their communities, to learn about the environment, uh, to make projects related to sustainability, to do hands-on learning, uh, and then to go out in the world and see the impact of their work. Um, so a couple of things to, uh, to start with. If we have teachers on the call, uh, Mr. Cunningham, I don't know if, uh, if any of the folks on here are educators or we're all students. Yes. Uh, Mimi's an educator uh, at a very large high school. It's affiliated with a university. And so are the people, and, and he actually has a, a class of students too. So I think we had two teachers in Nigeria that are looking on right now with their classes. And Mimi's uh, staying after way late uh, to watch this. Oh, cool, awesome, all right. Yes, I'm sure it's uh, way, way late there. Thank you. Uh, so we would go to uh, ecorise.org slash enroll if you're a teacher. I'll just put that link there in the chat. Uh, you'll get a form pop up that you can go ahead and fill out to get access to our sustainable intelligence curriculum for free. Uh, so this is available for uh, teachers to access. Uh, here it says $40. Uh, if you're a public school teacher, it's, it's free. Uh, if you're international, that makes it tricky for us to do uh, grant projects with you. We'll get there in a second. Uh, but you should be able to access the curriculum resource. Um, so just a, a quick tour here, uh, the way that our curriculum is set up, we have really detailed lesson plans, for example, this one, Introduction to Sustainability for Middle School Students. Uh, there's a summary, it gets into the different um, standards that are allied, uh, aligned there, and then of course, uh, lots of resources directly for students to use. Um, so hopefully you have a chance to go fill out that form and let me get into the curriculum and show you a bit more of what we've got. The uh, sustainable intelligence curriculum, I actually had the privilege to work on and help to draft uh, starting back in 2015, <clears throat> 2016, we were working with a school in Mexico in Tlalnepantla, which is just north of Mexico City. Uh, and we wrote this curriculum in collaboration with them. Um, so once you fill out the form, you'll get an email. Once you click on that link, you'll be able to log in uh, to this resource. Um, and so as you can see, there's a lot of stuff here, uh, including a section called Connect with Teachers from Around the World. Uh, so definitely check that out. It's not just in the US, it's international. Um, there's a good little introduction video uh, I won't show it here because of the lag that we sometimes get uh, with video, it makes it kind of hard to sometimes watch over Zoom, um, but it tells a little bit more about EcoRise, so I recommend going through the introduction. Uh, if 
any of y'all are working uh, in other languages, uh, I apologize. We have English and we have Spanish here since we developed this in conjunction um, with the Thomas Jefferson Institute in Mexico City. Uh, you can add a Spanish version to your dashboard. Uh, we don't currently have any other languages of our resources, um, although that would be a wonderful goal for the future. Uh, just a little note about IP, since we're sharing these resources, we just like for you to uh, keep them, you know, use them as you can in your classroom, uh, but don't make money off them. That's about it. And then otherwise, I'll get into uh, how we navigate the curriculum. Uh, so the way that the curriculum is organized is around seven eco themes. Uh, those are water, energy, food, public spaces, air, waste, and transportation. So they align really nicely with uh, environmental science. They're also aligned to uh, the LEED Green certification. So thinking of leadership in energy efficiency and design, uh, these are the seven themes that are touched upon when buildings are designed to be LEED certified. Um, so I'll get back into the resource here so you can see uh, some of the lessons. Go ahead and close this with the little up carrot. A couple of things that, um, well, I'll just dive into this uh, introduction to sustainability lesson. I think this is a, a great one, a great place to start. And we have a little uh, virtual um, option here. So Mimi, since you teach high school, I'll, I'll click over here to the high school lesson. So the introduction to sustainability lessons are really designed to show students uh, the consequences of tragedy of the commons, the need to consider the triple bottom line. We consider uh, people, profit or the economy, as well as the planet. Uh, whereas in most cases, businesses focus solely on profit, uh, balancing the triple bottom line really helps students to create that understanding of what sustainability uh, requires. And so this uh, is a game that you may have seen before called the going fishing game. Uh, we actually have students play it with goldfish crackers on a plate. Uh, or as I mentioned, we have a, uh, a version here that we can do with uh, a jam board uh, virtually it would look something like this. Go ahead and close this. Going fishing game virtual edition. Uh, so you would set students up in their groups, maybe of four, with a plate full of goldfish crackers, or in this case, a nice little graphic filled with fish. And you would tell them a story, essentially, uh, that this beautiful mountain lake is home to these four families. And you'd have your uh, students, each one of them, uh, representing the head of their household, and that their goal the way their family survives year over year is to fish. And so each family has to catch uh, at least four fish in order to survive. Any fish beyond that that they catch, uh, they can sell. You can set a price for those fish in your local currency. Uh, and you give them a very short fishing season. So in this particular example with the jam board, we would ask them to drag the fish over and sometimes they're clicking on the same fish as they're dragging, right? And they're moving them. They have to move them all the way to their homes to catch them. Uh, and then you call stop. And uh, with the goldfish, as it's explained here in the lesson plan, uh, you would have them use maybe a chopstick or uh, even a pencil to drag the fish to make it a little more challenging so they don't have... Uh, they're not just grabbing them with their hands. Uh, here's the materials, goldfish, pencil and chopsticks. All right. And uh, at that point, you ask them to count up their fish uh, to see if they've survived, how much money they've made. And you don't mention to them yet that you need uh, every fish in the lake that's left gets to spawn one more fish. And so sometimes what you see is in a very short period of time, uh, many of the fish from the lake are gone. And so you might have some households that are making money, right? Uh, but you see over time, 
the lake has really diminished in the quantity of fish available. So if these fish are able to reproduce, uh, you could even have a, a riff here where some of the fish are smaller, not as many fish left. Um, but if a family didn't get their tally of four fish, then that family is out of the game. You would say that they've they've perished or they have to move to another location to continue fishing. And you continue this game. Uh, as students continue, they start to realize that overfishing, taking too many fish out of the lake results in not enough fish left for everyone. They start to see uh, other households not be able to survive at that lake. Uh, and they start to consider strategies to survive. Uh, so one of the tools and resources we have on this lesson is a data collection sheet. We've tried to make all of our lessons really comprehensive uh, so that educators can pick these up, uh, print these, or make these virtual with a little fillable PDF so that students can uh, type in here. They would put, you know, who's participating, their names across the top, how many fish they caught, how much money they made, and how many rounds they got through uh, before they fished out their lake. They can do this data in a different way here, and they can also, uh, of course, graph that data to show kind of the uh, decline and then collapse of the fish population in their lake. And what we see is that students really quickly figure out if they take only the required number of fish and they leave plenty in the lake to reproduce, uh, that they're able to sustain the fish population uh, and the fish population can grow over time. So this is a nice introduction to answer this question about what is sustainability. And of course, there are many different definitions uh, there's a definition um, that the UN uses, which talks about making sure that the present generation is able to meet our needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. Uh, and the going fishing game is a good illustration of this. We talk about you know this graphic in particular. Uh, although one thing that I don't like about this graphic, even though it shows, you know, everyone fishing, taking their fish and leaving, uh, it shows everyone with a fishing pole, which, as we know, is not necessarily true. We know that there's a lot of inequity in the world and that not everyone has even the same ability uh, to access the resources they need and, and feed themselves. Uh, if this was a more accurate graphic, you would show uh, some of these silhouettes with giant mega trawlers and huge nets, and some people uh, with very little to fish with. This graphic in particular talks about sustainability uh, in a way that's really appropriate for secondary students, especially balancing people, the planet, and I like this prosperity instead of profit. Um, when we consider all aspects, uh, not simply just prosperity or the economic uh, variables, then we're really focusing in on sustainability, how to protect the planet, how to balance the needs of people, and perhaps how to live uh, a prosperous or profitable life uh, while keeping these other considerations in balance. So um, that is just the introduction to sustainability lesson that's in here. I'm going back to the curriculum resource now, and I uh, wanted to show y'all, um, again, this is under Introduction to Sustainability Lessons. Uh, we have a variation for elementary school that's a game of tag where the students play the fish and they play the fisher people. Um, we've seen uh, teachers use uh, a jump rope or a string to kind of designate the pond area, the fish stay within while they're playing their game of tag. Uh, and the fisher people using pool noodles, which are nice and soft, uh, to stand from the edge of the pond to tag the fish. Uh, or you can have them walk into the pond and you know touch the fish that they're tagging, the fellow student, and bring them, walk them back to uh, their household to consider them caught. Um, so I'll, let me pause there and see if there's any reactions or thoughts about that introduction to sustainability lesson or how you might apply it in your classroom. 
Mimi, could, could you tell her a little bit about the sustainability projects and stuff that you're doing right now and how this might could be helpful to what you're looking at, uh, what you're presently teaching? Oh, this looks very wonderful because I have in, I also, uh, in addition to my English language classes, I also teach elective courses. And one of the elective courses that I teach is um, climate change, climate crisis. And so this fits perfectly into that, you know, the curriculum. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. What, what projects um, that Michael mentioned have, have y'all done so far? Um, you mean the other subjects? Well, specifically, related. Yeah, 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 environmental either. projects. I explain to us some of the environmental projects and stuff you've done. Um, we've also worked with other schools, and um, like we all, I don't know if you've heard of the uh, Canadian organization Taking It Global, um, Center for Global Education. They also uh have schools uh, work together and come up with um, either students talk about, first they met, uh, I mean, they discuss their individual national policies. And also if like a lot of policies here in Taiwan, through our discussion, we realized that we are somewhat ahead of a, a, a number of countries in like restricting the plastic usage and everything. And so, yeah, and so um, the students were quite pleased with that because they, they, they hadn't realized we were like, you know, ahead and that most of them, if they didn't, you know, through this conversation knew about, you know, people in other countries, they mostly complain about, you know, the inconvenience of <laughs> the policies that bring about, you know, in their everyday life. So um, in addition to comparing the policies, the students also have to come up with their own student action plans. Um, how they can reduce their either ecological uh, footprint or carbon footprint. So that was, I thought those are some of the cute, uh, the nice projects that I have students do and, and they're not too difficult to, you know, to accomplish. Quizzes are good. I mean, like um, you get a certain amount of point uh, for transportation. Do you take the public transportation? Do you, you know, ride a bike or, ride, or walk to school? And then I have them go around asking other teachers the questions and then coming back and comparing and see which part we could improve to do better and things like that. Yeah, some of the things that we have done in the past. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, you know, it is funny to hear about a different perspective on inconvenient policies. Um, we make a lot of inconvenient policies <laughs> in the U.S., but we don't necessarily view them that way, which is so interesting. We're very... We're very focused on kind of personal liberty, but we don't realize that that comes at the expense of many, many, many things. Um, so yeah, I, I admire, for example, I know the, the EU has put a ban on single use plastics uh, and I could certainly see the inconvenience of that. Uh, the convenience of course being a living ocean and the ability to go to the beach without, you know, seeing, uh, damaged and dead wildlife and, and all the consequences um, that come from microplastics in our environment. Um, but yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned um, talking about climate change in your, in your course. And so I just wanted to highlight, uh, we are often adding new things to kind of the top of this resource, uh, sustainable intelligence, before you get into kind of the more um, traditional lessons we've been working on for the last uh, six or seven years now. But these lessons here, Introduction to Climate Resilience, are new. They were just posted uh, at the end of um, last school year. And so uh, it's nice to know that there are folks out there who uh, might be putting something like this into practice. Um, so that we have these new uh, Introduction to Climate Resilience lessons um, for elementary, middle, and high school. And so again, um, teacher resources here at the top, each of these opens in Dropbox and then student resources uh, here at the bottom so that you can you know, open and download. In addition to those dense lesson plans, um, you know, we clicked into the uh, introduction to sustainability for high school lesson plan. Um, I always like pointing out these climate resilience presentations and then they come also with teacher notes, uh, the presentations 
I think we've added them now in um, PowerPoint. Some of the older ones are still as PDFs, um, but this way you can you can download and edit. And they really um, are very visually focused, uh, very sort of um, an image, maybe a very simple text or a diagram. Um, and then the teacher's notes, I like to point out, really mirror the presentation, but with sort of comprehensive and scripted questions uh, to go along with them. And so I find them to be uh, really useful resources for teachers as long as they know that they're there. Um, so you would have uh, a little bit about the presentation that goes with the graphic and then some prompts for, teacher, for teachers um, getting into the curriculum. So for example, um, understanding climate resilience, we have our goals here, implementation, you know, provide the students with the KWL, that's a know, want to know and learn. Uh, and then as we get into the discussion, there's more information about it. Ask students, you know, what is the greenhouse effect? What are some of the consequences and what can people do and so on. So those resources are there, and I just wanted to point them out because our uh, introduction to climate resilience lessons uh, just went live probably, I guess, in uh, April or May of this, this year. Um, but you mentioned also, Mimi, uh, something that we're very focused on, which is um, students kind of auditing or examining their own practices. And so uh, each of these sections, the eco themes that I mentioned, water, energy, waste, food, air, public spaces, and transportation, they come with audits, um, which are ways of students to, to count or examine kind of their own practices uh, and then reflect as a campus, uh, as a community on the impact they're having on the planet. Um, so let's take a look at the energy ones, for example. Um, once you get into the modules, you'll see there's uh, lessons for each grade level uh, or grade band, I should say. Um, and we do recommend that you can scaffold up or scaffold down the lessons depending on the needs of students. Um, but right around in here, we start getting into like their personal energy eco audit. Um, you mentioned like students getting points for using public transportation, for example. Um, this is that kind of thing where we're asking them to take a look at how they use energy in their personal lives to kind of do uh, a personal examination and see um, their energy expenditure. Many students don't necessarily think about uh, the appliances that they're using or the time that they're using them for. Uh, and for many folks, students and grown-ups alike, I think, you know, one appliance is the same as another. It doesn't, you know, it plugs in, it turns on, and they don't necessarily consider uh, what might be more or less energy efficient. So for example, uh, a clothes dryer that has uh, a heating element in it uh, and might run for an hour at a time or more um, uses quite a bit of energy compared to something like a cell phone or a computer charger. And so we have some calculations here asking them to consider you know, kilowatt hours and uh, kilograms or pounds, uh, depending of carbon released. And of course, you would need to consider your source if your energy comes from renewables or non-renewables. Uh, in considering how much carbon is being generated. And so, of course, we have a little kilowatt hours cheat sheet here. We can't expect uh, this to be completely accurate, but really it's about the experience of students starting to learn and consider uh, what the different impacts are of their personal appliances and choices. Uh, and this is a good place for them to see, for example, um, the difference between uh, like a water heater, for example, can be quite inefficient, depending, of course, on which it is, uses a lot of energy uh, compared to something like, you know, the rate, having the radio on while you're uh, doing your, your schoolwork. Although I don't know who's still listening to the radio and not streaming it on their computer or on Spotify. 
Um, so they would do a personal energy audit. Uh, we have that listed in our middle school lessons, um, seventh, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Um, although really it could be uh, with appropriate scaffolding for for any less um, for any grade level. And then down here, as they start to get into uh, ninth and tenth grade, we have a similar audit for their classroom, where they would go around the classroom and examine how many computers um, do they have, how many um, compact, compact fluorescent bulbs in the ceiling. Uh, or other kinds of light bulbs? Does their teacher have uh, a little portable heater stashed under the desk, as sometimes teachers do? Um, we have blasting air conditioning in Texas, and then I've seen people actually put you know, heaters to keep their feet warm while they're teaching. Um, so they would examine everything that's plugged in in their classroom and do an audit for the whole classroom uh, and try to extrapolate how much energy they think their classroom uses over a particular day and then how many days of course throughout the year how many classrooms in the school uh, and we have a whole energy audit here for a campus um, so similarly this could involve looking at the school's energy bill interviewing the custodians about things like the HVAC system, um, you know, considering if the school has any solar panels or any access to renewable energy uh, outside, um, and uh, putting all of that into a report uh, at this stage in high school to really say, how much energy do we use? How much carbon does that generate? and what should be their recommendations uh, for making um, changes. And schools are often very open to this process because generally speaking, the biggest uh, demand financially on schools are salaries and teachers, and the second biggest demand is energy. Uh, so when it comes to an opportunity for financial savings, this is a huge one. Um, schools spend an incredible amount of money on on energy costs. And here at the bottom, there's a nice little uh, decarbonizing the electric grid lesson. Uh, this one was made in collaboration with a partner and even has a nice little um, outside game that students can play um, where they can fiddle with the electric grid, making more renewable energy, adding more batteries to the grid trying to see how to balance the, de the demands of energy with the possibilities of uh, renewable energy. And so we recommend this one, especially for um, high school students. Uh, and this is a, a great way to kind of cap um, what can be a little bit discouraging to see how much carbon is being released by their actions uh, with a more hopeful uh, and more constructive sort of um, the future view of renewable energy, uh, which we think, uh, you know, really leaves students with the idea that they can have an impact uh, on generating that low carbon or no carbon energy future. All right. Um, so let me pause uh, on the eco audits. Oh, I guess one thing I do want to show you. Um, just kind of a, a conclusion of a, a, a student group that did this uh, eco audit. I'll go to the energy data is beautiful. Um, this is in their uh, energy eco audit. And I, I do wanna show you, this is a high school from Austin, Texas that did this eco audit of their entire school. Um, Aikens High School students did this uh, quite a few years ago now, um, but it's really a beautiful example of what can be done when students do this kind of audit for their whole campus. Um, so I, I do want to get to the energy page here, but the students made this beautiful report, uh, had this group of kiddos who were working after school to really examine the impact of their campus, uh, and it creates a nice uh, visual for themselves, for their administration, something they can use in applications for uh, future endeavors, and also uh, a great example for us to show other folks what's possible. So uh, here is their energy audit. Let me back it up a little so y'all can see the whole page. But this, is, this was their conclusion. And so uh, 
energy facts. They discovered that they're using, you know, 3.8 million kilowatt hours of energy, spending uh, $323,000. And again, this was uh, over 10 years ago um, on their energy costs. And then they had some infographics to show them, uh, you know, how much energy that could save that the energy they use at their campus could power the Cowboys stadium for 45 days. Uh, you know, could the money that spent could buy 646, la 646 laptops for their school and, and whatnot. So um, what are they doing right? Well, they turn the air conditioning off at night and they have some new uh, energy efficient features in their new uh, T-STEM lab. Um, but again, lots of room for growth when they did this audit. So just showing you kind of the, the conclusion and then students presented their findings to their administration. Uh, and Austin ISD has been on a uh, move towards more sustainability uh, for more than the last decade. So this fit very nicely into their district's kind of goals uh, of energy savings. They did the same thing for basically all areas of their campus. They did a water audit, they did a waste audit, they did a food audit and they did a transportation audit. Um, and I guess their last one here was green spaces. So yeah, beautiful example of um, when you have students really inspired by the idea of sustainability and working together, um, what they can accomplish. So in our uh, resources, we have those tools to support students to do audits with all these different areas. Uh, and for younger students, um, there's really beautiful lessons related to um, each of these areas as well, teaching them kind of the basics of what is energy. Uh, some of my favorites are here in terms of, you know, where we see water, um, what we learn about water, um, some things about filtration of water and the limitation, uh, the, the limitedness of water on the planet, especially fresh water and so on. So um, I really do encourage teachers uh, who are there to go to that link that I dropped. Um, hi there, nice to see you. Um, go to that link I dropped in the chat and see if you can uh, sign up. You should get an email, like I mentioned, uh, enroll. And, um, and then from there, you should be able to click the link and access uh, the Sustainable Intelligence resource and, and all those 160 lessons that, that I just showed you. I actually think it's more than 160 because um, we've been adding like the climate resilience and the decarbonizing the electric grid and whatnot. But what other questions do you all have? Now, Jerry, do you have any questions or do you do anything like this or how could you implement this? How can Elizabeth help you implement something like this in your school? Ahmed? Okay, well, we're waiting for Ahmed. Mimi, how could you use utilize this in your school and what you're currently doing? I think it's great. I mean, you have all these detailed plans. I, how many years have you been working on all those lesson plans? That's a great question. So um, EcoRise is about 15 years old. Uh, we started with just two folks in Austin who had a vision for asking students to note and notice things about their environment. And actually the two folks who began it were artists and they started their background uh, studying murals in Brazil and street art in Brazil. And so it was, uh, yes, about sustainability at first, but really about inviting students in to be co-creators and co-designers of their world, which is something that we don't often ask students to do. We They come into the class, we say, there's your seat, sit there, this is what we're learning, this is what we're doing this is what you got and off you go. Um, and it was really about asking students to pause and look around them, to ask them, how does the space make you feel? 
Um, what do you think is good about the space and what could be better about the space? And so from there, uh, it evolved into thinking about how can the space serve us, be sustainable and safe and healthy for us. Uh, and so we had kind of scrappy sort of one-off lessons where we would have like, you know, a lesson that's like became the public spaces audit where it's like, okay, go into your public space, notice how people are using the space, notice what's good about it, how it makes you feel and what could be different. Uh, and so for a long time, it was very kind of individual lessons here and there. Uh, in 2015, EcoRise hired a sustainability um, curriculum person who really helped us put all the lessons into a very formal uh, aligned format where we aligned with the next generation science standards and common core standards here in the US, as well as the TEKS in Texas specifically. Uh, and then created that format of several lessons under each grade band, under each eco theme. And so that was about a two year process between 2014, 2015, up until 2016 or 2017. And we've been using that template and that design um, and expanding and improving on it since then. So um, the curriculum in its current format has been around for a about five or six years, uh, and we continue to, to grow and expand. Um, and if you like the curriculum resources, Mimi, let me um, show you, once you sign up and once you have access to the resources, I do wanna show you a few other things that are embedded in sustainable intelligence. Um, so, so again- So I sign up and I can get access to all of those things, all those yeah, material that you show? Oh, that is great. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, Michael knows this. I said this when I presented in Del Valley. Uh, it often sa I sound like a salesperson to myself. I can hear it. Um, <laughs> it sounds like I'm pitching you something, right? Uh, but we are a nonprofit. And so again, the goal is simply uh, student education, teacher education with the goal of students having access to this, this knowledge. Um, so in addition to the Spanish language version, which might not be super relevant to y'all, um, I do want to show you under teacher resources here. If you scroll down to uh, introduction to environmental justice lessons, um, these are based on United States uh, standards and United States uh, stories, um, but I see how they could be adapted for an international context. Um, this is something you can add to your uh, curriculum dashboard. If you scroll uh, introduction to environmental justice lessons, access these free lessons, add them to your Canvas dashboard, click here. So once you, once you sign up, go to the teacher resources and then click here and you can add these lessons, introduction to environmental justice lessons. Um, they're extremely helpful for helping students understand history of environmental justice and mindsets of how some people in the environment in our world have more access to more resources, others have access to less, kind of introduces them to concepts like, um, we call it NIMBY, not in my backyard, uh, the idea that you don't want the power plant or the landfill right next to you and why. Um, and then it tells the story of uh, many of these environmental justice heroes, folks who have been working, again, specifically in the United States, but I know that there are folks in your own context uh, who have been pushing back against environmental racism and environmental injustice um, and give students the opportunity to understand how they fit into this story of equity uh, and inequity. Um, so I recommend that. I also recommend, I wanna show you um, our introduction to design thinking curriculum. Um, design thinking, of course, is a process that's used a lot in business uh, to get folks to consider the end user of a particular product uh, and then design something that they'll find beautiful and useful. Uh, and so, let me close all these again. Um, here at the bottom, we have this section on eco audit grants. Uh, and this is where it gets a little tricky in an international context, because I don't think we have funds currently to give grants internationally, although I would love to, to see that. Here in the US, we do give out micro grants uh, 
between usually $500 to $750 per grant for projects for students. Uh, and so in order to help students design and build good uh, environmental projects, we have this section here on design thinking. And so if you go to step three under eco audit grants, design an innovative solution, and you scroll here to the bottom, you'll see our design studio curriculum is a great tool for developing and refining student projects. And you can access design studio here. Uh, so design studio is really probably my favorite resource. Um, sustainable intelligence is great. There's a lot of content there. Um, but Design Studio really shows how to uh, design a project in order to make a change. Uh, and so I love this because it's aligned to how to use design thinking in education. Um, the process of helping students identify a problem, uh, brainstorm various solutions, empathize with the person who would in the end uh, be using uh, their solution or how their solution would impact others, creating uh, tools and resources and testing their solution, and then sharing that out with the world. Um, so design thinking is a cycle, it's a loop, and uh, we encourage teachers to adapt this resource for whatever their content is anytime they're doing a project. Um, there's lots of great tools in here to help them um, brainstorm, refine, uh, improve, empathize. I'm really looking for, here we go, this graphic. <laughs> uh, identify, explore, create, refine, and share kind of in, a, in an endless cycle so that um, these activities, tools, and resources are a pedagogical approach, a way to teach, um, less so a content like what is pure water, potable water versus non-potable water and why. Um, but you can you can explore and use this resource uh, in order to use project-based learning in your classroom um, most effectively. And so uh, I really recommend it. I think it's it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, and the way that it's organized is kind of in these um, different sections like, um, you know, here, identifying possible design challenges. <clears throat> You'll see, you know, different lessons, brainstorming with Pi, you know, which activities or projects are they most passionate about, uh, which one is most feasible or achievable, um, and which one would have the greatest impact. Uh, and so you'll see different um, times needed for these activities, you know, quick 20 minutes, click in here, and then you'll see the activity, you know, what are you trying to do? Your group may have a lot of different ideas, and then this activity helps them narrow it down. So lots of great resources here. Um, again, this one, a way of teaching, a way to make uh, design thinking useful for the classroom. Um, not so much content as a style of teaching with design thinking. Um, so I wanted to show you that because those are both uh, embedded in sustainable intelligence. And so once you um, fill out that enroll link and click the link to get sustainable intelligence, um, click through and then you can add, here's Design Studio, that one's included and you can add um, Intro to Environmental Justice. I showed you that one, that one's included as well. Um, so I have a lot of other stuff on my dashboard, um, but you would have at least these three um, after you sign up. Thank right, you, that is now. very helpful. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was thinking that we could uh, have some kind of video conference so you could showcase some of your students' uh, work sometime later in in the spring what do you think Mimi yeah I would really love to see uh, students in action or you know showcasing what they have accomplished you know with all these uh the toolkits that the teachers provided them with the resources that you provide yeah, and maybe we could do something on environmental justice and then try to do something from an international perspective especially with uh Degradation of uh, you know mining in, in different areas. I know some places are just uh, 
become vast wastelands because the companies have just mowed down all the uh, uh, environmental issues. So uh, we can even do a mediation with that. I was thinking about that. I'll, I'll, I'll explain later, but uh, I think that would actually be kind of nice. Then we invite Elizabeth and Eco Rise to come back and and maybe see what, what we're doing. Also, I was thinking about that. If we could get maybe get a, uh, uh, a deal with some of your local uh, environmental people that we may not have ever heard about, you know, uh, and uh, they could do a, 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 not a report, but they could do a, a, um, a list of, uh, not a list, but, you know, take a look at their environmental justice uh, people. And they have a real good one on Cesar Chavez, which is uh, very interesting to me. And then maybe we could do some from Nigeria. We could do some from Peru. We could do some from Taiwan. And we get to meet some of the international people that we have no idea about. So, so it may make a, a lot of difference to other people. What do you think? I love that. I think that would be wonderful. And uh, as I mentioned, we started, a, you know, with a we started the curriculum project with a cross-border partnership uh, with Mexico. And I know that was... Originally, the the vision, we have kind of one-off projects working internationally, but it would be great to continue to expand internationally. Uh, if you see some of the schools that we're working with in Nigeria, it's uh, uh, they have very limited resources, so this could be a real blessing, but they, they also have some very keen minds that could actually help and in, in show people how this should be an international deal that it can't just work in one country. It has to work internationally. Because the air doesn't just stay in one country. The air blows. You know, that's Isn't tough. that the truth? And the carbon is impacting yeah. us all. Yeah. So, you know, if you cut down one and you increase another, you don't really cut down. So it's, it's kind of important. Uh, Nigeria, we're, we're about to wrap up here. Uh, did you want to add anything or say something or how you could implement this, Ahmad? I think they're going in and out, but uh, I'll, I'll talk to them uh, later. But I think there's about five or six schools in Nigeria. Only one could come today. And we have several in um, um, South America that, that were, weren't able to come. I was talking to Mimi about something, and, and uh, uh, I asked her to stay over. And I know she's very strong into this, and taking it global as a, a nonprofit out of uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And it's uh it's been going around for maybe since 1995, so it's approaching uh, 30 years now. Uh, but they have some really good uh, programs, and uh, we could uh, be doing this. Uh, we're we're trying to do some mediations, and uh, this would be a good example. To do some scenarios, especially when it comes to uh, environmental justice, where a lot of people are not getting not getting. Uh, not getting their voices heard for sure. So I think this would be kind of good. Also, uh, in Mimi's case, they have an initiative in which uh, everybody by the year 2030, if I'm correct, and Mimi can tell you, uh, is supposed to graduate from high school from Taiwan is supposed to be able to speak English. And one of the things with the workshops and stuff like this, not only does Mimi teach, uh, she teaches uh, English as a foreign language, but she also teaches environmental, but she could use this as a way to learn and then the presentation skills and stuff would be real helpful too. So you you are not only helping the environment, but you're helping with English as well. Oh yeah, you have to have content to practice language. So a thousand percent. Yeah. Well, we, we thank you so much today. And Mimi, do you have any questions? Uh, the, the most important thing is to sign up and then sh you, you can start and we'll go back channel and we'll talk and see how we can implement this thing between us. Uh, one last question. Um, uh, I know the dot enroll part is for the teachers, uh, but the main page to the one that's equalrise.org, is that open to all? I mean, can I introduce the this uh, web page to the students? Definitely, and uh, they're welcome to explore it. And one thing in particular, I'll give you a link. Um, there is a page of student innovation projects. And so I, I mentioned the um, eco audit grants and uh, certainly the projects can be done 
with or without a grant, they can design and propose an idea. Um, although it's a question uh, if they would be able to put it into practice if they had the funds. Uh, but there's two resources I put there, a YouTube playlist uh, that I see. Yeah. And um, that has a lot of the video applications. And so students recording themselves talking about what they're going to do. Uh, and then the list of projects there uh, is great for students to take a look at to just see what our kids, you know, in other places in the world um, doing and putting into practice. Wonderful. <laughs> we have, I, I have the um, wide range of students, uh, type of students, one that are, you know, very motivated, but then there are ones that are not so much, you know, into learning. So, so I'm people. trying to gear them towards, you know, motivating them to, I mean, look for things that they can learn on their own. So I give them resources to click into. And if they, you know, sometimes, sometimes the things catch their, you know, catch their attention, then they, uh, they go for it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And so typical, right? People are people. <laughs> yep. I, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again, Elizabeth. And, and we'll invite you back and we'll keep you abreast of what we're doing. But uh, I really appreciate this. This is marvelous. And I think uh, Mimi will take and run with this. Uh, yes. And help her out a whole, <laughs> a whole sure. lot in, in her teaching. Uh, let me also put my email here in case uh, any questions come up or if anything okay. looks weird as you're registering internationally. Um, so there's my email. Don't hesitate to reach out with any questions or concerns or I can send you direct links into the curriculum uh, if you need them and that kind of thing. So um, try the enroll link first. And then if you hit any roadblocks or if any other questions come up, just send me a quick email. And thank you so much for staying staying late, staying up late, Mimi, for us. Okay, let me see. I don't think I can copy and paste, so I'm going to type it again. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't allow copy and paste. Yeah, Zoom sometimes, if you haven't updated it, I have that same problem too yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Hmm. Well, yes, have me invite me back anytime, Michael. It was a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for coordinating. Uh, and I really appreciate the impact you're having, positive impact on uh, fellow teachers around the world and, of course, on your students there in Del Valley. We're oh, we, we appreciate uh, you uh, so much, and we thank you again. And uh, I, I will be working with Mimi, and I'll send you back uh, some of our proposals on what we're going to try to do. And uh, and I think it's a it's a real blessing to have such a great asset here, right, locally here in Austin. And we want to try to uh, spread the word all around as much as we can. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great day, guys. Great Thank you. Day. Thank uh, you. Uh,